You are back with Get Connected. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. I want to continue uh, talking about misinformation, especially when it comes to the online world. We're going to be talking with uh, a couple gentlemen behind uh, an excellent website. It's called COVID19misinfo.org. Again, COVID19misinfo.org. This is a fantastic resource if you want to find out any information uh, about the COVID-19 uh, virus, uh, if uh, the, the articles or information you're getting are real or uh, not. On the line, we have uh, two of the, uh, the gentlemen behind it, uh, Anatoly Gruzd and Philip Mai. Thanks for joining us, guys. Hello. Thank you, Michael. So tell us about your website. How did this come about? This website came around early March when uh, the uh, WHO declared the um, COVID-19 as a pandemic. So the Canadian government put out a call for proposal uh, from medical professionals and other researchers um, in communications and uh, technology to basically help to combat the infodemic that they uh, saw was coming um, against the, uh, this um, pandemic. And we were one of the team uh, with colleagues from Royal Rose University that put in a proposal. And our part of the proposal was basically to um, take a look at and document the type of misinformation that are um, going around. The goal of the project is to basically learn from this particular pandemic and see if we can come up with mitigating um, um, things that we can do to help reduce the impact of um, the misinformation on um, the work of public health officials, but also to learn so that um, there will be future pandemics in the, in the future. And we want to be able to basically use this as an opportunity to also learn so that next time when something else like this roll around, we have things in place that we can implement right away. So what are the ultimate goals to, to make sure that uh, the public has the right information? So one of the goals that um, you know, Philip explained is to document what's happening, what kinds of misinformation being shared, by whom, on what platforms, and is it really effective? Uh, that's a bigger research goal for us. But another important key aspect of this project is to kind of inform and educate uh, Canadians about the types of misinformation that is out there. I hope that by kind of looking at existing patterns of misinformation and looking at examples of uh, false and misleading claims, Canadians can kind of learn the similar patterns and recognize them in the future messages they might get from their friends, family members, or strangers to so social media. Kind of a part of their digital media hygiene, if, if I can say that. I want to talk about a few of the examples that you guys are covering, but. Um, how are you discerning from fact and, and fiction? Are you guys doing that? Are you getting that information from other sources? So um, we ourselves are not fact checkers, but there are a network of fact checkers around the world that are part of media organizations of universities who focus specifically uh, um, on uh, debunking uh, claims. Um, so what they've done is they do their thing and they are part of uh, the Google fact checking tool, which basically is uh, an initiative by Google to aggregate all of their, uh, the various fact checkers work from around the world into one single database. And then they created an API that allows researchers like um, Anatoly and myself at the social media lab to get access to that API uh, and then work with the data coming from these various fact checkers. And I totally can go a little bit about how we um, go about doing that. Yeah, just to add uh, that, because these are all different uh, fact-checking organizations from different countries, uh, often driven by journalists, uh, we find they have different standards and different ways they categorize claims. Uh, so there's a variety of ways to report on a, a misleading information or information that may be telling you something about the COVID uh, virus without context or uh, incorrectly setting uh, statistics. Um, so as a result, uh, we have to normalize all of these claims coming from different agencies in different countries to make it useful uh, and package it in a way that uh, Canadians can go to our website and see what's happening and look at trends over time. 
What are some examples? You, you said, uh, you know, these different fact checkers, fact checkers use different standards, like how, what are, you know, are they saying this is true? This is false. Do they have a rating system? Is that what you're, you're getting at? Exactly. So each claim that has been fact checked, uh, will get a, a kind of score and some may have a rating, uh, let's say how false, uh, how false the information is and could be completely false, partially false, or par partially true. Some will, will say, uh, you know, misleading. Some will say misguided. Some will say there's an error uh, or misquotation. Uh, so as a result, having all these different rankings, it's actually quite confusing if I were to try to understand, is it really false or what is, what is it false uh, uh, in this story? Uh, so we're, we're talking uh, with uh, two gentlemen behind uh, the COVID-19misinfo.org website, a fantastic resource to check the facts about COVID-19. If you're reading something on Facebook or Twitter or the web and you want to know if it's real or not, this is the website to go to. Uh, you, have a, you have dashboards uh, up on, on the website. How do these work? So we have a couple of dashboards on uh, the uh, COVID-19 misinfo portal. The, um, the primary one is the one that we've been talking about, which is um, gathering all the fact check uh, claims uh, and put it in one place. So you can come and search to see what's currently floating around the internet and on social media on a particular day. Uh, you can see what was floating around, let's say, three weeks ago. Um, and then we also have another um, dashboard that specifically look at how Canadian uh, media is covering COVID-19. So it tracks and keep track of every single uh, misinformation related story by a major Canadian news sources in Canada. Because for example, um, places like uh, the CBC now has a dedicated unit that um, a couple of uh, reporters um, who's beat during this time is to cover COVID-19 misinformation. Um, and other media outlets have done the same. So we gather all their work again in one place. So this way, if you miss any of the stories, you can see it all in one place. And then another one that we have is a bot check uh, dashboard for those folks who use Twitter. We capture every single tweet that contained the word coronavirus or the word COVID. And then we look at how likely it is that the account tweeting with that hashtag or those hashtags are um, using automation. So it's not a certain 100% that they are uh, uh, bots, but it could be that uh, somebody is using some form of automation to um, gain or amplify their message. And we want to bring that um, into the spotlight. It, it doesn't mean that they're doing anything nefarious, um, but at least now there's a way to quickly for reporters and researchers and others to say, okay, here are the top 50 accounts tweeting about coronavirus. Of those 50s, here are the ones that are probably using some form of automation. So this way, it gives you a chance to zero in and say, okay, are they, um, is everything hunky-dory or is, are they doing something uh, funny? One of the reasons, of course, uh, to look for automation is because previous research indicated um, these type of accounts that may be part of a, a bot network that propagates uh, certain false claims and misinformation. But in addition to looking at uh, potential bot accounts, we're also looking at what links Canadians are sharing on, on Twitter, because Twitter has been uh, very prominent in terms of um, sharing news, um, credible news and non-credible news. And so one of the concerns that we've been observing uh, through this Twitter dashboard is the increase of number of links uh, leading people to partisan websites. And even though partisan websites are not necessarily uh, kind of publish false information, they often package information in a way that exaggerates things and may lead people to believe for, about something that is not really true. Are you able to discern with the the Twitter bots, for example, but I would assume it would be also the same thing for Facebook posts and even YouTube videos, the origins of some of this stuff and whether or not it's originating from Canada or is that still too difficult to determine, uh, you know, who's behind some of these uh, false information campaigns? We really can't. So that's one of the thing that, you know, that old meme from the 90s about on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Um, <laughs> it's still true today. Um, the 
platforms themselves have a lot more information. They have information about when that account was set up, uh, the time frame, the IP address, and so on. Um, so they have a, a lot more information. Us as um, a researcher from the outside looking in, we don't have that information. But what we do have um, to add is information about whether certain, uh, so certain memes, certain posts, or image uh, being portrayed as if it's taken, let's say, in Canada. But in fact, uh, we can see that the picture, the video, uh, it's an old uh, content that was maybe taken in Mexico or somewhere in Europe. So you can see a lot of that. You certainly cannot really say for sure who are the people or bots behind that type of uh, dissemination. You uh, have done a survey up on your website that I found very interesting. Uh, and you made an infographic uh, out of it as well uh, to make it even easier for me to <laughs> wrap my head around uh, some of this. Uh, who was the survey sent out to first before we get into some of these facts? So uh, the survey was sent out to uh, 1,500 Canadian adults uh, who use internet. And we wanted to know uh, where they get information and news about COVID-19 uh, and whether or not they encounter misinformation on social media. And if they do, what do they do about it? So, what, so some of the, I'm, I'm going to just say some of the interesting facts uh, or, or uh, some of the results of this uh, survey. 60% um, of those surveyed said uh, their preferred medium to get COVID-19 news was 60% was television which I, I found very interesting, especially with the amount of uh, younger people, millennials, tuning out of TV and you know, going to online sources. 53% uh, said news websites and apps. 29% said they prefer to get their COVID-19 news from radio. 23% from print, like newspapers. And 22%, thank God, uh, from social media. So it seems like the traditional forms of journalism still uh, are, are the most preferred mediums to get this news? This, um, this survey basically reflects what other surveys have shown is that during a uh, time of crisis, people um, consumption changes. Um, for example, the crisis is a fast moving story. So as a result, it's difficult for print, for example, to keep up um, at times. So people know that TV is where it's at for fast moving stories. Uh, that's why, for example, when a hurricane is blowing through um, a state, people turn on their TV uh, to watch the weatherman, you know, with his umbrella uh, um, turned upside down, simply because they know it's now, now, not now, 10 minutes ago. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why when we are asking people um, in this survey about this specific type of misinformation, COVID-19, because it was so new, it was only a month and a half in when we asked people this. So as a result, I think that's why you're seeing the, the answer that um, it's 60% television. The other reason uh, potentially is because uh, public health officials and uh, elected uh, officials made a point to have press conferences that televised that uh, in, in real time. And uh, Canadians kind of know to expect when, let's say, our prime minister will be speaking, when our premier will be speaking. And uh, so I think that also adds to the viewership for the te television. The question, of course, uh, as Philip said, we don't know if that habit will, will stay or not. But I think it's, a, it's nice to see that Canadians are turning to credible uh, news sources via television and other uh, channels rather than potentially to uh, missing living information that's being shared on social media. One of the things that you uh, polled uh, people about in this survey, uh, I found this very interesting as well. The, the trust in the accuracy of news about COVID-19. So when they're getting news from these different sources, you know, how much did they trust them? And so when we look at uh, public service or government ministries and departments giving news, 61% of those surveyed said they trust that information. It, it drops, it, it's interesting, there's only 49% trust in mainstream media. And it, it just keeps going down from there. 33% uh, of uh, the survey respondents trust political parties and their leaders. No surprise there. 30% uh, friends and family. I, I thought that might be higher. Uh, and then it goes down to 12% uh, for partisan uh, sites. Doing the, doing the survey, guys, what was the most surprising information that you got back? 
I think there are a couple uh, things we can uh, we can highlight. So certainly, it was good to see that uh, the majority of Canadians do trust our public uh, uh, service and government ministries and departments, and it kind of reflects the fact that at least uh, in, in here in Ontario, we see a lot of people following. Uh, like quarantine and lockdown orders, more or less. And this is a, a huge contrast to what we've seen in the U.S., for example, where the, there is not as, uh, the trust towards the government is not as high as here. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, a reflection of the fact that uh, we are a higher trust society and the U.S., for example, as you're watching, is becoming more of a, what they call a low trust society where people don't necessarily trust their neighbors and um, you're supposed to pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. Here, we have um, a more communal way of looking at things, comparatively speaking, um, to um, our cousins down in the U.S. Um, and you can see that reflected in the fact that, again, uh, there was a, the, there was, you know, a 61% trust in the, the government. Uh, we still believe that government can deliver goods and services here in Canada. I mean, there's always stories of things failing, but overall, people are still, you know, trusting of the government and uh, public officials. The other interesting fact we discovered uh, that even though only 22% of um, survey respondents rely on social media to get news about COVID, uh, there, you know, over 90% of them use some form of social media. And what happens is that even if you're not actively looking for information about uh, uh, COVID-19, you may still encounter misinformation. So then we ask, well, if you do encounter what you believe is misinformation or false claims or misleading claims about COVID, what do you do about it? And so the interesting result was that not a lot of Canadians, actually, majority of Canadians, about 56% of them, didn't flag misinformation content to social media platforms. Uh, we expected that to be much higher because plus social media platforms rely in part uh, um, for users to indicate and flag uh, inappropriate or questionable content. And then once the content is flagged, then that's been passed on to fact checkers. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things um, in the lead up to um, the pandemic is that many of the um, social media companies put out press releases in um, early April touting the fact that, you know, they are um, making it easier than ever for um, people to report things that they see that might not be right. And yet the survey is telling us that, you know, the majority of 56% did not use the reporting feature. So for us, that's interesting because uh, we want to know, like, why is that the case? Um, so for us, that's some of the future research that we would want to get into is um, why is there a mismatch between what the companies are saying and what the people are actually doing who are using their platform? Maybe it's not that easy. I, it, it brings up a really int interesting question, guys. Um, when it comes to reporting misinformation online, you said that 56% 56% didn't according to the survey. I wonder if that's because people are lazy and don't care or to your point, they don't know how, like it, 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 it's not easy for them to do it. Yeah, like I said, that's us, we don't know. And that's one of the line of research that we're probably gonna be digging into is basically um, trying to figure out and um, doing, um, you know, um, survey and asking people specifically about that. Do you have any thoughts uh, as to why? I think it's a mix of factors. Um, as you also indicated, it could be that people just don't feel uh, their actions will influence and impact uh, the quality of information on the platform. In part, it's because platforms are not that transparent uh, when it comes to reporting inappropriate content. And it's not just uh, when it comes to COVID-related misinformation or misleading news. It's all kinds of uh, flagging activities. When we as a users report something or flag something that is inappropriate, it's a black box for us. So essentially, uh, we don't know whether the action was taken or sometimes if we do get a notice that, hey, you flagged something and that content was eventually removed, that may take uh, days, weeks, and maybe months sometimes. So I think the lack of transparency may uh, kind of discourage uh, future reporting from mm -hmm. uh, credible users. It reminds me of studies they've done at um, a 
babies at orphanages uh, who at the beginning they'll cry a lot but when they cry and nobody comes to help them they learn to stop crying that's why they see a lot of babies at orphanages um, they don't cry a lot same thing with social media users they've been taught over the last decade and a half that um, the, the reporting feature is like those um, button that you push at the red, at the red light waiting for the um, walk signal to start. You don't know if that uh, button is just there for you to push or does it really work? No, that is an excellent, uh, a couple of excellent points. But, uh, you know, I, I say to the listeners right now, if you do come across misinformation uh, online, report it. Uh, Hopefully, they're doing something about it. I mean, that's the only way that they're going to find out, essentially, if there is, uh, you know, crappy information up on Facebook or, or Twitter. And so I encourage the listeners to figure out the tools uh, to do that. And to your point, yeah, these social media giants, they need to make that uh, a little more uh, representative of, you know, when someone does that, like they need to get feedback. You know, if they get no feedback, like you said, it goes into a black hole. They need to follow up with some type of uh, communication system to acknowledge that, uh, you know, that person has uh, flagged that piece of content and if there was any action uh, taken uh, on that. I, let's uh, delve uh, into a, uh, uh, an example uh, from your uh, website uh, of uh, misinformation. And uh, this was kind of uh, an, an interesting uh, one. Uh, it uh, concerned the uh, hashtag film your hospital. Tell, tell us uh, what that uh, social campaign was all about and uh, how your website, uh, you know, dug in into that uh, campaign and, you know, found out, uh, you know, where, you know, the, the main spots of that were and whether it was false or true information. Um, in late March, um, we noticed that there was a new hashtag that was gaining some traction. Um, the hashtag was film your hospital. So we were able to basically see, uh, go back and get the data of the very first time that particular hashtag film your hospital was used. What was that about and, film your hospital? So film your hospital, there's a conspiracy or a host out there that believe that the whole pandemic is a hoax. And one of the way that the uh, conspiracy theorists are hoping to prove that it's a hoax is to show that the hospitals are empty, the waiting rooms are empty, the parking lots at hospitals are empty. So their theory is that um, if these things are empty, it must mean that the whole thing, the pandemic as a whole, is a hoax. Um, what they don't take into account um, is you know, leading up to um, the uh, pandemic, the CDC and other health authorities recommended to doctors and hospitals to uh, delay um, uh, procedures, to um, separate um, um, emergency areas so that uh, people with heart attacks and broken legs can go there without uh, getting uh, a secondary infection from people who might have COVID. So there's a different wing for COVID. So as a result, I mean, there are just simple explanation for why these things are happening. But what they were doing is they were encouraging people to break quarantine and then go drive out to these uh, hospitals and film them. And somehow that empty hospital or empty parking lot is somehow evidence that the whole thing is a hoax. But basically that's the gist of it. <laughs> yeah. And so we try to understand uh, uh, how this campaign, this meme, Film Your Hospital, spread on social media. Uh, and who are the people behind it or, or users behind it? Uh, and so one of the concerns that um, we had that campaigns like this are being propagated by kind of fake uh, automated accounts and maybe even influenced by uh, for foreign power, you know, foreign um, uh, countries. But what we discovered that actually uh, uh, quite influential uh, users on extreme right in the U.S. Uh, were at the beginning of this campaign, they propel uh, this belief and ask their followers to go and film their hospitals. Uh, so real influential users. Um, and then you have a lot of Trump supporters who joined the campaign and started propagating uh, and a second wave of this campaign happened uh, on, on Twitter. So in fact, we discovered that even though there were some coordination uh, in, in what Twitter calls inauthentic behavior that led to Twitter blocking some of these accounts permanently or temporarily, overall, the whole kind of network that spread this belief and hashtag and calls were actually uh, supported by pro-Trump 
uh, far-right politi politicians. And then the third wave, what happened is actually it went international. So you have a, a secondary spread outside the US of this campaign. So you see now people in Brazil, for example, uh, asking their supporters to go to, the, to their hospitals. And so the meme, kill me a hospital, now morphs, and then they're using the uh, Portuguese language to, to do the same in, in Brazil. So it, it was a hoax. So what happens then? Uh, you know, they, they have that hashtag, film your hospital. Does Twitter take that down, that hashtag? Nobody owns hashtags. Uh, so essentially anybody can use the hashtag. And that's one of the beauties of uh, Twitter. And now other platforms kind of adopted this hashtag model because it helps us to identify the topics that we like to be part of, uh, that we want to follow. Uh, so essentially anybody can use a hashtag. What Twitter does essentially, they look at what they call coordinated and inauthentic behavior. Essentially, when you have a bunch of accounts are trying to quickly share some kind of information in a way that humans will not do. And so Twitter say, well, this is against our uh, you know, platform policy, and we're going to try to stop you. But of course, uh, it's very easy to create a Twitter account. It's one of the beauties of the platforms that uh, people can join the platform. But at the same time, it's a downside that uh, bad actors can inf infiltrate the platform and try to propagate that hashtag and make it appearance uh, also to look like it's uh, something that's um, widespread. But in reality, it may not be. So they would basically go after those accounts that were propagating this and shut them down? The, only if they are behaving in a way that's inauthentic, meaning they are free to have their opinion. They can, uh, if they believe that this is a hoax, they can continue to believe that. Um, but if they do something in the video or share information that violates the term of service, then it will be taken down. Simply because, again, uh, they, um, I feel for them simply because they're walking a fine line between giving everybody a platform, but at the same time, they know that the platform sometimes will help to propagate things that can harm people. Um, but at the same time, they don't want to be so draconian that they will take um, things down. So I mean, it's a fine line. Uh, so no, that, that hashtag is still going. Um, but like I said, specific tweet might be taken down simply because something that is said in there or shown there that violates uh, their term of service, then they'll take it down. Yeah, the tweets like uh, will create manipulated uh, media or synthetic media. We all heard about deep fakes. Uh, so this would be against Twitter policy. So if they were detected or somebody flagged that content to Twitter, that will likely to be down, uh, removed um, or user maybe even suspended if they continue sharing this type of content. Uh, if a tweet promotes violence uh, or threatens someone against an individual or group of people, that also against the policy. If a tweet is interfering with a, a particular election, that's also against the Twitter's policy. And of course, bots. If uh, Twitter feels that the campaign, the hashtag, had been promoted, propelled by uh, artificially amplifying the spread, you know, using bots, uh, that those accounts will also be flagged. We're talking with the gentleman behind COVID nineteen misinfo.org. You need to go to this website to, to get the facts on uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. If you've come across information on social media or the web and you want to make sure uh, what you're reading is true, this is a fantastic resource for that. Uh, we've got uh, Anatoly Gruzd and Philip Mai who have joined us uh, today. I want to thank you both uh, for coming on the program. No problem. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you.